Welcome back. In part one of this series, we saw how geocentrism fails to explain the seasons, understand the Earth's tilt, or explain basic observations of the inner and outer planets. In this part, we'll revisit that crazy sun spiral idea, which I'll abbreviate to CRASS from now on. As the explanation given for the Earth's seasons, there is more that it cannot explain, and its effect on the other planets needs to be considered. If the Sun were really magically moving up and down in space just to make Earth such a lovely place to live, what happens to the Sun's axis of rotation? If it changes so that our view of the Sun differs little throughout the year, then the tilt of the Sun's axis must change. As the Sun spirals up to the June solstice, the Sun's rotational axis would have to tilt to match. Also, to keep the view of the Sun consistent throughout the day, the Sun's rotational axis would have to precess once a day as it circled the Earth. The degree of precession must also change every day as the Sun travels its crazy spiral. When on the celestial equator, the Sun's rotational axis will have no precession. It must then increase again as the Sun heads to the December solstice. There is no sensible mechanism by which this can happen, let alone produce the jolly convenient, annually repeatable result that it does. So what else might be going on with the geocentric Sun? If the Sun's axis of rotation stayed the same throughout the crazy spiral, that would make life easier for the Sun. It would also give us a fantastic view of its poles in June and December. We don't get these views, so it's obvious that this doesn't happen. The Ulysses spacecraft was designed to characterize the heliosphere with solar latitude. To do this, it needed to travel around the Sun's poles. If Crass were correct, JPL could have simply launched Ulysses ahead of the Sun to meet it as it descended, instead of going all the way to Jupiter and slingshotting the craft out of the ecliptic plane. The reason why this trajectory was necessary is that this infantile explanation of the seasons is bollocks. Seasons are also seen on the other planets, so it must follow for the geocentrist that Crass is the cause of them. If that were the case, then the seasons on all the other planets must also have a one-year cycle, wherever a planet happens to be on its circuit of Earth, because the Sun supposedly moves up and down in space once a year. Consider Mars. Its seasons aren't annual. Spring is about seven months, summer about six, autumn 5.3, and winter a touch over four months. Why? Because the length of the Martian year is 1.88 Earth years. Jupiter's seasonal cycle clocks in at 11.86 years. Saturn, 29.46. Uranus, 84.1. And Neptune, 164.86 years. How can planets go through their four seasons in these times if the Sun is moving up and down in space once a year? Of course, the primary reason for the observed seasons on the other planets is the same as for Earth. The planets each have their own axial tilt, which results in changing seasons as they complete their orbits of the Sun. Geocentrists might like to note the stunning coincidence between the length of each planet's year and the time it takes to orbit the Sun. Crass also introduces strange behaviour to the planets. Whilst it would be simplest to think that they just circle the Earth on or near the plane of the celestial equator, this isn't what we see. On the solstice of December 21st, 2012, you can go out and see Jupiter, it'll be 21 degrees above the celestial equator. How so? The Sun's position against the background stars moves from west to east over the course of the year, by a little under one degree per day. This traces a line called the ecliptic, which also defines a plane. In reality, this is the plane described by Earth's orbit, and is tilted to the celestial equator by 23.5 degrees due to Earth's tilt. Observations of the planets show that they are always seen near the ecliptic, this is perfectly consistent with heliocentrism, but not with geocentrism unless the planets move from the celestial equator. Because the geocentric Earth is fixed and the Sun moves up and down, the plane of the ecliptic must therefore tilt up and down throughout the year with the Sun. You can see that there's an axis about which the plane would tilt. What does this mean for planetary motion in the geocentric universe, though? Planets that happen to be on the same side of the axis as the Sun will move up and down in space with the Sun. Those on the other side of the axis will move contrary to the Sun. A planet's motion must therefore invert whenever it crosses this conceptual line in space, somehow. It's as if each planet is riding its own invisible seesaw. Here's an illustrative geocentric planet, which we'll call Geocac. Let's ignore, for now, the changing distances of the planets from Earth that we saw in Part 1, and consider the simplest possible case. Our geocentric planet travels in a nice neat circle on the ecliptic, and is seen to drift against the background stars as the months and years go by, tracing out the blue line. 
The end result is that the planet travels a rather extraordinary path through three-dimensional space as the seasons roll by. We saw that the Sun had its crazy spiral which couldn't be explained by any physics, but now we have planets that ride their own crazy spiralling seesaws. Obviously, geocentrists haven't considered the implications of their silly explanation for the seasons on the rest of the solar system. The maximum range of a geocentric planet's movement up and down in space depends on its proximity to the tilt axis of the ecliptic, i.e. where along its path it is. Imagine our planet's circle on the ecliptic spread out flat. We see that the limits above and below the celestial equator are imposed by two waves. The planet follows its own harmonic motion within these bounds. To prove that their model is correct, geocentrists should be able to produce a single equation that works for all bodies in the solar system, encapsulating these features. Firstly, it needs to describe the up and down motion of the body with the seasons using a wave with a period of one year. Secondly, it needs to have that motion bound by a second wave for the sidereal period of the body. You need to know that time before you can produce the formula for an object. You've lost the ability to predict motion for newly detected objects before you even start. Thirdly, the planet's up and down motion must invert every half period of the bounding wave. Fourth, your formula must account for the fact that the orbits are actually inclined to the ecliptic. This has the effect of skewing the bounds on either side of the tilt axis. Assuming you get anywhere near this goal for one object, it still won't match observations, because planets just don't move in nice neat circles around the Earth. So, fifth, your formula also needs to allow for the changing distances from Earth that we observe. Yep, you need to combine the above unworkable nonsense with the concept of epicycles. We already know that it took up 13 volumes when Ptolemy tried it, and that it's bollocks. You also need to be able to explain what natural forces cause all this crazy motion. Good luck! To further grasp the problem facing the geocentrist mathematician, let's zoom out and consider a more distant planet. It will complete its orbit much more slowly. Being further out, it has to physically move up and down further, and with higher accelerations to remain appearing near the ecliptic. Here's our graph for our first planet, Geocac, correspondingly scaled to this diagram. The more distant planet has a larger range of motion, so the amplitude of its bounding wave is larger, and because it circles more slowly, the wavelength of the bounding wave is much longer. Our second planet still has an annual harmonic motion within these bounds though, and we see the same inversion of motion when it crosses the ecliptic axis. In 3D space it's even crazier. That's the geocentric concept. Here's how it applies to Mars and Jupiter in the five years from September 2012. Neither the planets nor the Sun move up and down in physical space like this. Geocentrists insist that this crazy motion for each object must be going on, but they cannot explain it. All they have are childish claims of conspiracy, plus an inability to provide real answers that explain everything we observe in meticulous detail. All they need to do is stump up that single toolset for describing the geocentric motion of the planets. Over 100,000 known asteroids out of probable millions, over 4,100 known comets, and over 1,000 known Kuiper Belt objects out of possible billions. There are rather a lot of objects in the solar system. A lot of them are in orbits whose planes are nowhere near the ecliptic, as this chart showing the observed distribution of asteroid inclinations demonstrates. Geocentrism presents the crazy sun spiral in the myopic hope that a half-baked explanation for the seasons covers all bases. The inevitable consequence of crass is the crazier planetary spirals. Craps. Until they can explain what forces give everything the motions that are necessary to keep their universe moving in a manner that matches observations, they're just parading their own stupendous lack of even a basic education. Here's what they're up against. In the real world, we have Kepler's laws. He took it upon himself to find a model that matched the detailed observations of planetary positions made by Tycho Brahe. For the first time, it was possible to calculate the motions of the planets with greater accuracy than any geocentric model managed, and they are still of use today. We have Newton's laws, which work to fine accuracy with only a minuscule difference from general relativity in gravitational fields of the scale found in the solar system. And of course, we have general relativity, which works to fantastic accuracy. It has passed every test of it so far. It explains the minute anomaly in the perihelion precession of Mercury, it gave the first correct calculation of the deflection of light from distant stars by the Sun. It predicted gravitational redshift, black holes, the geodetic effect, and frame dragging. Understanding general relativity is the reason GPS maintains accuracy for everybody who uses it. 
Geocentrists think that verified physics is wrong, or works in some parts of the universe, but not for the special case of Earth. So now it's time to present their tested and verified maths and physics. Ladies and gentlemen, the sum total of geocentrism's contribution to human knowledge. Oh well. Valid physics has predictive power, famous examples being Edmund Halley's use of Newton's methods to predict the return of the comet that bears his name. John Couch Adams and Urban Le Verrier independently worked out that another unknown planet explained the deviations of Uranus' orbit. On September 23, 1846, Neptune was found within one degree of where Le Verrier predicted it to be. Le Verrier also recognised the anomaly in the precession rate of Mercury's orbit. This anomaly was explained by general relativity. This ability of the accumulated body of real physics is how we know that the asteroid Apophis will pass within the orbits of geosynchronous satellites on April 13, 2029. It's worth noting that none of this information is ever provided by geocentrists. So what explanatory and predictive powers have geocentrists shown? This is, of course, because geocentrism is, and always has been, bollocks. However much its educationally bereft proponents whine like little girls about conspiracies and supposedly false science. It can't even explain its own claims. In the educated world, we understand and predict the motion of everything, because real physics works, and explains what we actually see beautifully, and what we don't see are planets moving up and down as if they're playing about on invisible seesaws. In part 3 we'll leave craps and crass behind to look at a selection of other observations that geocentrism fails to explain, and we'll see how it stacks up to basic forces. See you then.